a new species of early human, a three-foot-tall, small-brained hominin that lived for over a million years, right alongside our ancestors. Sounds like something straight out of a forgotten chapter of our evolutionary history, doesn't it? Well, that's exactly what anthropologist Darren Curnow proposed in 2010 when he named Homo gautengensis. He claimed it was a completely new type of early human from South Africa. But here's the mystery, the contradiction, the fundamental question at the heart of our story. If this was indeed a member of the Homo genus, the very group we belong to, the handymen known for their tools, why do we have absolutely no evidence that Homo gautengensis ever made a single one? Today, we're digging deep into a fossil controversy that has profound implications for how we understand human evolution. If you're fascinated by the messy, complicated, and often surprising story of human origins, Hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Let's get to it. Let's rewind to 2010. Darren Kerno takes a fresh look at a pile of hominin fossils from the cradle of humankind in South Africa. For decades, these bones, things like the Stir 53 skull and a partial skull known as SK847, had been bouncing around from one species to another. Some called them Homo habilis, others Australopithecus, others still a handful of different things. It was a taxonomic mess. Kurnow's bold idea was simple. Maybe they weren't any of those things. Maybe they were something new entirely. He saw morphological differences, a skull that was too distinct tooth crowns that were too varied and concluded they belonged to a separate, previously unrecognized species. He named it Homo gautengis, after the province where all the fossils were found. This wasn't just a nerdy reclassification. This was big. Kerno was proposing that a whole new, separate lineage of Homo lived in a region where we already knew multiple hominin species coexisted. We're talking Australopithecus africanus, Paranthropus robustus, Homo habilis, and Homo ergaster, all wandering around the same landscape. And the time frame? It's mind-boggling. The proposed range for H. gautengis is from about 1.8 million years ago all the way down to 800,000 years ago. If that's true, this species existed for over a million years. That would make it one of the longest lived and earliest members of our genus. But that's the if. Because from the moment this species was named, its validity has been deeply, deeply contested. A lot of leading paleoanthropologists, like Lee Berger, have openly said there's little reason to consider it a valid species. The fossils Kerno assigned to it are still, to this day, shuffled back into other, more established species. The SK847 skull alone has been attributed to at least seven different species over the years. This isn't just an academic fight, it has a huge practical consequence. If you can't even agree on what a species is, you have no way to attach behavior to it. It's like trying to describe a person's personality without knowing their name or who they are. This creates what we can call a behavioral attribution void, a kind of black hole where we simply cannot scientifically say what this species did. So, let's set aside the taxonomic controversy for a moment and look at the physical description of H. gautensis itself. Curnow described it as a small brain, large-toothed hominin. And that right there 
is a massive contradiction. Why? Because the entire evolutionary trend for our own genus, Homo, is about getting bigger brains and smaller teeth. Homo habilis, the handyman, is defined by a brain size of around 600 cubic centimeters. In fact, a bigger brain is part of the criteria for even being considered a Homo species. But the skull Curnot designated as the holotype for H. gautensis has a cranial capacity of less than 480 cubic centimeters. That's smaller than the accepted minimum for Homo habilis and falls squarely into the range of its more ape-like predecessors, the Australopithecus. Then there are the teeth. H. galtensis is described as having big teeth suitable for chewing plant material. This also runs counter to the general trend we see in other early Homo species. As H. habilis and later H. erectus started incorporating more meat into their diets, food that was pre-processed using stone tools, their teeth and jaws got smaller. But H. gautensis seems to be going in the opposite direction. This suggests that if H. gautensis was a thing, it was an ecological specialist who ate mostly plants not a meat-eating generalist like other Homo species. This dietary emphasis, combined with its small brain, paints a very different picture from the standard view of a master toolmaker. We don't know much about its body below the neck because a lot of the fossils are fragmentary, but based on some estimates, they were only about three feet tall and probably retained a lot of ape-like features, spending time in trees for food and to avoid predators. This is also a major difference from later hominids. So, just based on what little we know, we're left with a profile that doesn't scream master toolmaker. Small brain, big teeth, plant-based diet. These are not the characteristics we associate with the species that were getting a bigger brain, smaller jaws, and butchering carcasses with sophisticated tools. For a long time, the story of stone tools was pretty simple. Homo habilis was the handyman. He was the first. He invented tools. And that was the key to our genus, our big brains, and our success. End of story. But science is never that simple. A few years ago, archaeologists in Kenya found something that completely changed the narrative. At a site called Lomekwi 3, they found stone tools dating back 3.3 million years. Let's put that into perspective. The earliest generally accepted Homo fossil is from about 2.8 million years ago. Homo habilis shows up around 2.1 million years ago. So tools were being made and used more than half a million years before the earliest Homo existed. This is a complete game changer. It means that the ability to make and use tools wasn't just a hallmark of our genus. It was a skill that developed in earlier hominins, probably the Australopithecus. This pushes the origin of tool making back in time and expands the list of potential candidates for early technology beyond just the Homo lineage. What does this mean for Homo gautengensis? It means that even if it did make tools, it certainly wasn't one of the first. It entered a world where tool making was already an established behavior, 
and where multiple species were likely already using them for different things. This makes the question of who made the tools we find even more complicated. For decades, if you found a tool in a site with both Homo and Paranthropus fossils, you just automatically assumed it was the Homo who made it. But we now know that's not a safe assumption. And there's a fascinating geographical pattern that adds another layer of complexity. In East Africa, where you find fossils from both Homo and Paranthropus, the tools are almost always attributed to Homo. But in Southern Africa, where Homo gautengensis was found, the pattern is different. Here, Paranthropus is more commonly associated with tools. So, if Homo gautengensis were a valid species from Southern Africa, its potential role as a toolmaker would need to be considered against the backdrop where a different kind of hominin was more commonly associated with tools. So, we've looked at the taxonomic status, the physical characteristics, and the broader context of early tools. And now, we get to the most important question of all. Is there any direct evidence? Did anyone ever find a Homo gautengensis fossil in direct association with a stone tool? Did Kernow himself even propose a link between the species and tool making? The answer is a resounding and somewhat anticlimactic no. A comprehensive review of the original research reveals a critical silence. There is no direct archaeological evidence. No cut-marked bones. No specific tool assemblages found with H. gautengensis remains. There isn't even a hypothesis from Kernow himself explicitly linking his new species to tool production. This stands in stark contrast to other early hominins. Homo habilis was literally named the handyman because of the tools found with it. The Old Oldowan tools were found in sites with early Homo fossils. We have a clear and long-standing association. For H. gautengensis, we have nothing. The fossils are found in a region of South Africa that is absolutely crawling with early hominin remains and tools. Sites like Swartkrons and Dremolen have yielded evidence of controlled fire, of Homo erbaster, and of tools. But because all these hominins were living in the same place at the same time, any tools found there could just as easily be attributed to the well-known tool makers like H. Ergaster or H. Habilis. There's no way to definitively say a tool found there was made by H. gautengensis. The most scientifically robust conclusion we can make is this. Based on the available evidence, there is currently no basis to claim that Homo gautengensis was a toolmaker. Its potential role remains entirely speculative and unsubstantiated. The story of Homo gautengensis is a fascinating one. Not for what it proves, but for what it reveals about the process of science itself. It shows us how difficult it is to piece together our past from a few broken bones. It highlights the controversies, the debates, and the ever-shifting nature of scientific consensus. The case of H. gautengensis 
further complicates the simple linear story we used to tell about human evolution. The idea that tool making was a skill unique to our direct ancestors, a single species invention, is now completely gone. We know tool making came before Homo. We know different hominins used tools for different things. And we're now faced with the possibility of an early Homo species that may not have even been a tool maker at all, which would make it an evolutionary outlier. It teaches us that evolution isn't a straight line. It's a messy, branching, and often contradictory process. And every new fossil discovery and every reevaluation of an old one gives us a more detailed and more beautiful picture of our own strange past. But now we want to hear from you. Do you think the evidence supports the idea of a new species? Or do you agree that these are just other fossils from already known species? Let us know in the comments below.